hello, uh, welcome to our uh, event today. My name is Erin Peterson. I am the Director of Mission and Partnerships for the Colon Cancer Coalition. We're so excited to have you today uh, to learn about how your story can make an impact and maybe even save a life through colorectal cancer screening. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and we will have it to share um, in a couple days after we've had a chance to put together some of the Q&A and things into a blog entry for it as well. So look for that link coming in a day or two. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please use the chat feature in Zoom to ask those questions. We will have a Q&A following the uh, entire presentation for questions with our storytellers. Um, before we get started with the presentations, I would like to first introduce Annie McGarry. She is a Senior Specialist for Corporate Events at Olympus Corporation of the Americas. We are thrilled to have them as a sponsor of today's webinar, and we are also excited to announce this morning that in addition to sponsoring this webinar, Olympus is also the presenting sponsor for our National Tour de Tush virtual event that's happening in May and is open to all. So Annie, if you can... Uh, I know you have a couple things you'd like to say, so if you can come off mute and turn your camera on. Can you see me? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> awesome, thanks Erin. And uh, we are so excited about uh, uh, Tour de Tush. So um, hello to everyone who, uh, who uh, is out there viewing the program today. I wanna to start by saying how honored I am to be speaking in the company of such brave individuals, um, people who are willing to speak up and share their stories. I also want to thank Dr. Albert, who will be sharing his knowledge and wisdom and the Colon Cancer Coalition for their incredible advocacy. As a pioneer and innovator in the endoscopy space, Olympus is proud to say that we have been a partner with Colon Cancer Coalition for 10 years. Woohoo! Um, our uh, time with them, during our time with them, we've sponsored awareness raising events like Tour de Tush and Get Your Rearing Gear. Um, but this is the first time that we're joining forces to shine a light on an important topic your voice and your colorectal uh, screening, colorectal cancer screening stories. This year, Olympus has an ambitious goal to gather 100 stories of the 1 million colorectal cancer survivors in the United States today. Education, advanced technology, and early screening have led to the impressive number, and we hope the stories of others, some who have um, been diagnosed early on, others whose cancer was found at a later stage, uh, will inspire others to get screened. Today, we hope you take away tips and tools to help you craft your story uh, to inspire colorectal cancer screening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. And I would like to invite our the next presenter, our first presenter, uh, Dr. Andrew Elbert. He's the Medical Director of Digestive Health at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center in Chicago. His mission is to end preventable deaths related to colorectal cancer. And through his efforts, Advocate Health System has achieved a greater than 80% screening rate. Um, realizing that traditional messaging around colon cancer prevention was not enough, however, Dr. Elbert launched the social media campaign hashtag back off colon cancer in 2017. Within weeks, the scratch roots approach became a nation or worldwide movement with thousands of people joining the campaign. He was honored for this work as one of tw 20 most inspiring Chicagoans by Streetwise Magazine. He is a leader in the NCCRT Hospital and Health System Advisory Board and leads best practices in colorectal cancer screening across the country. He's held numerous community and corporate events to bring the messaging to those who need it most. I'd like to invite Dr. Elbert to set the stage for us today to hear um, what you hear in your practice about how stories impact screening and what is the state of colorectal cancer screening now, one year into the COVID-19 pandemic. And don't forget, if you do have questions, please enter those into the chat. And with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Erin. Thank you to the coalition for having me. Um, if you think that your screens are, uh, are not projecting correctly, uh, they are correct, they are, they are just fine. Uh, I did dye my beard blue today. Um, I think that uh, the, not only are stories important, but things that capture people's attention and capture people's interest are equally as important. Um, 
I feel that it sparks conversation. And so I do this yearly and I'm happy to be here and talk to all of you about just pretty much anything relating to colon cancer and its awareness. Um, I had an option today uh, to create a whole slide deck, but the truth is we're slide decked out. We're all spending a lot of time on Zoom calls and I wanted to make it more of a conversation. Let me just add again, what Aaron, echo what Aaron said that uh, I'm happy to answer questions and my clinic does start this afternoon, but I, I'm happy to take them in the uh, chat box. So I'm the medical director of gastroenterology and digestive health at Advocate Aurora Illinois Masonic Medical Center here in Chicago. Uh, nice to see you all here. Um, what I thought I would do today is just give you a, a, a safety story of sorts and explain what that is shortly uh, and share with you the struggles we're having. Um, on one hand, you know, I've been living in this space for, for probably the past four years, and it has been incredible to meet those with the stories that have lived through colon cancer. Um, I feel like we tell a lot of stories to each other, and it's, I feel that it's so important if I could add my two cents to not only share them with each other, but also share them with those beyond just ourselves and our families to actually proactively go out there and share with other people what the struggles have been or what the wins have been. Um, because I think all too often we share them with each other and, and, and that pretty much is, is it. Um, so I had the chance to give a safety story. A safety story uh, is basically a story that demonstrates in our medical community, uh, in our higher level meetings, executive meetings, um, an opportunity, it gives us an opportunity to share a, a, almost like a fail or a, a problem that happened in care and the care continuum, because as you know, there are so many steps in care. And then at the end, talk about how you fixed the problem and how you all succeeded and you persevered and how you are going to change practice moving forward. And it's a way for doctors and clinicians and executives to all basically be on the same page with regard to health outcomes. Um, but the safety story I gave about a week or so ago um, was different. It was a story that had no ending and you're gonna be part of that ending. Um, so prior to COVID, colonoscopy was the standard of care. 65 to 70% of people were screened across the country and things were really good. We even got up to 80% at our hospital, which was fantastic. Fit tests were of modest use, but the process of colonoscopy was pretty seamless. But last spring with COVID coming into play and people postponing non-emergent procedures, unfortunately, um, the apprehension of, of going through healthcare, even today, um, is still high. Um, from March to May of last year, colon cancer screening dropped to 10% from 80%. And all the wins we've had, all the successes we've had in colon cancer screening became insignificant because now all of a sudden the screening rates fell precipitously. Um, and so at the end of the day, colorectal cancer screening fell by the wayside, understandably, while our country was going through this pandemic. Um, the alarming numbers and statistics continued. Not only was there a drop in colon cancer screening, but there was a drop in cervical cancer screening. There was a drop in prostate cancer screening, lung cancer screening. And although this is about colon cancer, it's important to understand the landscape. Well, ultimately, um, we saw fewer, fewer cases of colon cancer. So I mentioned that we shouldn't necessarily feel reassured by the dropping numbers of colon cancer because it's not so much that colon cancer numbers are dropping, it's that the testing for it has declined. And that's a really important distinction and where you come into play in, in a short bit. Um, the data suggests that there will be a 10% increase in breast cancer, but also a 17% increase um, in colon cancer deaths in the coming five years. Um, the incredibly hard work we have all done to prevent colon cancer, and I'm so sorry for the noise, by the way. Um, the incredible work that we've done for, to prevent colon cancer is now, has now been coming apart. And that, that's where all of you come into play. The statistics point out that we plan an approximate 100, well, not plan, expect about 100,000 lives lost to colon cancer in the next 10 years because of the pandemic. So before we were all rallying around stories and best practices and sharing our testing strategies, but ultimately in the end, um, COVID took it even further and made our missions, all of our missions on this call, on this webinar, even more important. Um, anyway, I'll shorten my story to say that to all of who are involved in this process, we have focused on COVID for a very long time, for the past year, actually, almost exactly a year to the day. 
And so now that we're finally coming out of COVID and now we're finally getting vaccinated, we're not there yet, but still getting better. My question to you is, what are we gonna do now? Who is going to champion colorectal cancer screening? Who's going to take this further than they've gone before? Could you do that much more? Now that we anticipate all these lives that are gonna be impacted by colon cancer in the next uh, 10 years, what are we going to do differently? Yes, we could share stories and I love the stories. My question to you individually is, what are you gonna do differently? Because not be before, it was about colon cancer screening and sharing stories and trying to get people aware. But now you're dealing with people who haven't been screened over the past year with this sharp rise that we're anticipating, this wave coming. And so I guess my question to you is, will you be that champion who has a safety story like this where you know of these things coming down the pike. And the question is, are you gonna help solve that safety story with a positive win? Are you gonna take your story and take it further and inspire more people so that that safety story has just a good, as good of an ending as it did before COVID? And so that's what I wanted to bring to you today is I'm not gonna sugarcoat and tell you that we should screen. It's more than just about screening. It's about empowering all of you to know that we now just got set back so far in our medical community and we can use all the help we can get from you. So I hope the story resonates with you. I hope it's not too uh, abrupt, but I want it to be clear because if we're gonna fight colon cancer, we're gonna make people aware and save lives from it. It's important to know where we're starting from. So all that said, um, any help you can offer in sharing your stories and your messages beyond the conventional ways, even if it means dyeing your beards blue or your hair blue is always welcome. And with that, I will stop there because I think I'm going to go over and just say thank you to all of you for your efforts outside of the uh, GI Scope Lab. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Albert. That was a really nice way to set the stage for what we're going to talk about and how everyone can have a role to play in screening and getting those screening rates back up. Um, those numbers are startling thinking about where we, how far we have come in the last year from where we were so um, really the hard work that needs to get done to get those numbers back up. I appreciate your time if you can um, stay with us for some questions and later or if we can get you to come back that would be great otherwise uh, thank you so much for being here with sure. us today. Sure. I would like to turn it over now to uh, Gail Fritchie. Gail is a longtime volunteer with the Colon Cancer Coalition he is the ideator, the creator of the Tour de Tush, started back in Allentown in 2015, and now that nationwide virtual event that we talked about for May with our partners at Olympus. He became involved in planning the event while going through treatments for his own stage three colon cancer diagnosis that was discovered during his routine colonoscopy screening when he turned 50. His hope is that by sharing his story, uh, through events like this and Tour de Tush, he can make an impact on um, so many communities in the fight against colorectal cancer. He openly shares his story whenever he can to make sure others know of the importance of this life-saving screening. Gail, I'm going to turn it over to you. And don't forget to our attendees today that if you have any questions, drop them in the chat and we will have a Q&A session when all the presentations are ended. Gail, take it oh. away. Okay, I do have, I'm going to share my screen here. I do have a slide deck. It's not a big slide deck, but um, okay. Okay. Does everybody see this? Okay, am I good? Gail, I think if you, you must have two screens. If you want to look at the top of your screen and switch the view. Okay. Um, okay, I see. Is that good? We go. We're good? That okay. looks good. All righty. Um, I've got to go back one here. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Aaron. Thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, it's been uh, kind of a long road for me. It's uh, uh, actually coming up. I'm coming up on seven years. April second, two thousand fourteen, is uh, when I 
um, went for my routine physical or physical and, and colonoscopy at, at, at the age of 50. So I just said, told you what my age is, but um, <laughs> I look a lot younger, right? So, um, but anyway, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I didn't really know, know much about colon cancer. And, um, you know, I was, I, I've been active my whole life. I have no family history. Uh, I don't smoke. I uh, don't, um, I eat pretty healthy. I had really no, um, uh, no symptoms whatsoever. So I, I go into, uh, you know, get my colonoscopy. And next thing I know, a couple of doctors are standing, uh, you know, over me, uh, you know, with a kind of concerned looks on their face and saying that we had a pretty, pretty uh, large tumor that they found. And, uh, and then that's, that's the start of, of, of my journey. So it was a matter of, uh, you know, learning more about, um, you know, as much as I could about colon cancer. And, um, you know, I, I, was, was going through some of the statistics relating to, to colon cancer and just kind of, you know, I, it really struck me that we have a major problem because of the numbers that, that, that don't go through the screening process. Um, you know, it, in, in my case, it was pretty silent. And, and I just started wondering, you know, how, how many people out there are, um, you know, uh, the same, same boat as I am and, and don't get screened. Like if, if I, you know, guarantee if I didn't go, get screened or if I you know, was very reluctant about it uh, back then, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. So, um, you know, uh, they found, you know, I had stage three colon cancer, um, probably within a year out, out of, of stage four. So, um, you know, I feel very fortunate that, that my doctors pushed me to, to go and have that done. Um, and, you know, I decided that, you know, a lot, a lot needs to be done in the, the, you know, we have a problem. I, I had the resources and 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 really had the interest in in helping out and and trying to find a way to to increase awareness. Um, so you know, I contacted the Colon Cancer Coalition, and um, you know, they uh, you know they, they they had never done a bike event, and uh, you know, you know, talked to them about the possibility of doing one. So they said, yeah, sure. You know, so we went ahead and. Uh, partnered on that and started a, the, the, the tour de tush. And, um, you know, and I, I, I got to, uh, you know, thank Andy McGeary. I've been with, you know, working with Andy for seven years now to Olympus. Uh, Olympus was actually their first sponsor or actually our first sponsor. I walked in, um, uh, you know, Olympus, I, uh, you know, they, they're in the Allentown area. Um, that's, that's their corporate headquarters. I, um, thought, you know, I knew they manufactured the scopes, most of the scopes for, for colonoscopy. So I figured that would be a good place to start. And I literally, I, um, you know, they didn't know me. They just took a, took a you know, took a, a wild, uh, you know, chance. And, you know, they committed. It, it took actually one day to get the commitment, I believe. It was $10,000 for our first event. And so at that point in time, it was like, well, I think we have an event now. So, um, so we had to, to move forward and it's been growing ever ever since and and now um as aaron mentioned it's it's national uh in, in the virtual environment so um you know uh you know all the reasons i have on this slide deck are the reasons i you know wanted to uh you know wanted to um you know raise awareness and you know and 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 i zero in on the save save the lives thing you know we had to volunteer our first our first event he was actually our dj and uh you know, he, he, he hadn't gotten screened and um, he was like probably 65 or so. Um, he decided he better go get one. So he did. Um, he, he, his wife called me up. He had stage two colon cancer. So that's a example of, um, you know, how we can save lives with, with increasing awareness and having these types of events. So why is it important to do what I do? I mean, you can, uh, you know, there's nothing more, more important than, than, than someone's life. I mean, it, you know, life is, is, is precious and that's what we want to try to preserve and, and help families, um, you know, uh, and, and, and detect colon cancer early so it can be treated and so forth. Um, you know, the, the screening rates uh, weren't not, I mean, when I first started this, they weren't the best. I think at that point in time, it was about a third of the population didn't get screened on time uh, or didn't get screened at all. So um, that that's what, you know, that's, that's the main thing that that we do. And and and, and also to reduce uh, pain and suffering. You know, I, 
I went through six months of chemo, um, a lot of side effects. You know, I still have neuropathy in my feet and my hands. Um, and uh, but you know, I, I basically had to go through through it to to uh, reduce reduce my chance of having a reoccurrence. And uh, you know, and also getting the word out with colon cancer is, is multi generational, and one of the areas in which I personally would like to focus a little bit more more on is the the uh, Early, you know, folks early in life. I mean, it, it's, I think if this, if I'm, if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what I've read is uh, 40, 40 people under the age of 50 get diagnosed a day. And those people um, are, uh, you know, most, most cases when you're younger and you, you know, doctors don't necessarily want to um, go through the screening process because they, they feel you're too young, but most of those cases are uh, more advanced stages. How would my diagnosis be impacted if I were 45 years old? Well, first thing, I, I probably wouldn't have gone through the stress of, of, of the, the diagnosis, as much of a, a stressful diagnosis, as well as uh, going through, you know, chemo. Chemo's, you know, pretty tough. So, um, you know, and it has a lot of side effects and, and a lot of suffering going on. So, um, you know, and it's a very stressful situation. You know, you're, you know, I was off work for six months because of it. Um, while I was going through treatment because of, you know, it, I was nauseous basically all the time. So, um, so it, it's basically, a, it would have impacted me a lot if, if they would have caught it, you know, at an earlier stage, had a, a colon resection and be done with it, you know, so, um, so that's, and then here's where I've shared my story. Um, uh, you know, the Olympus, I, you know, I want to thank Olympus again. Um, they actually, uh, uh, I, I participated in a um, uh, a uh, video that they they actually sent about uh, you know a group of about fifteen videographers to my house to do a uh, do a uh, a nice you know talk about you know my story so that was very nice I was interviewed by the New York Times um, if you actually type my name in in New York Times you'll find it. Um, and the New York Times did an article on, uh, you know, the early detection, the change of the changing of the guidelines from 50 to 45. Um, so, so there's an interview there. Um, oh, can everybody still see that? It's really weird. Okay, and um, you know, Lehigh Valley Health Network did a uh, uh, did a story, and uh, that's that's out there as well. And then, and, and any chance I get, I get out there and. Uh, you know, if anyone, any, it doesn't matter the size of the radio station, newspaper, whatever, um, you know, if somebody comes to me and wants to, uh, to, to talk to me, then, um, you know, that's, you know, I, I'll be willing to do it. So, um, so yeah, I guess my, my message is, you know, um, just, uh, uh, you know, don't miss your screening, get screened on time. Um, I know, um, as a uh, you know, doctor Dr. Albert was talking about you know the, the we're, we're being set set behind, which is is I think is a, is a motivator to to uh, sort of get back to work and 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 sort of try to try to make up that. So um, uh, that's that's pretty much all I had. So uh, you know, thanks thanks for having me here. Thank you, thank you, Gail, for sharing. That was. Uh, very important to see how you are able to do that as just an individual being able to share your story. We appreciate you being here with us today. I would like to um, next bring, uh, bring up Amy Johnson. Amy has a little bit of a different story than Gail and she's really been able to take her story and um, make a real impact in a world outside of the colorectal cancer space. Amy is a small business owner in Minnesota and a longtime volunteer for the Colon Cancer Coalition, going back to our very first Get Your Rear Gear events in Minneapolis. She's taken what she learned through the years working with the organization into her everyday life. Um, and that knowledge came in handy when her husband had his colonoscopy at age 45 because of his family history. But he wasn't the only one with family history. Amy's father and her sister both have had polyps and she herself had polyps removed during her first screening colonoscopy. Amy and Pete co-founded Rock the Heart, a 501c3 organization dedicated to provide accurate information about thoracic aortic aneurysms, aortic dissension, and other aortic valve diseases um, through outreach to the community through music. 
We've invited Amy to share today, not just her screening story, but also how she has taken another family health emergency and made an impact through Pete's story for those living with aortic diseases. So if you have any questions for um, Gail or Amy while she speaks, please put those in the chat and we'll do those in the Q&A. But Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Erin. And you know, like you said, I volunteered at the first Get Your Ear in Gear in Minneapolis. And I didn't even know anything about colon cancer. I just knew my dear friend, Kristen, lost her sister and started this program to, to raise awareness. And it was gonna be a race and I was a runner. Um, Kristen was the kind of inspiring person that when I was ready to quit at mile 10 of the Twin Cities Marathon, she ran up behind me, saw me walking, and she brought me to the finish line. And that's what she did with this organization. That first race, I will always remember volunteering and being there at just what was a normal 5K, but the endless sea of people who just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming, and they had different colored t-shirts for their families. They were all honoring somebody who was either a survivor or who they had lost. And I was just completely overwhelmed by the impact that I could see this was having and continued to stay involved. Like I said, I knew, I knew nothing about colon cancer, but I started learning about the importance of getting that early screening at age 50. And I know that the organization was also pushing because more and more younger people were being diagnosed at advanced stages of colon cancer. So that big part of their initiative was going earlier. When I married my, my husband, he mentioned he had a family history of many cancers. Colon cancer was one of them. So he was on the docket to get his early. So at 45 years old, he had his first colonoscopy. And thankfully there was nothing found, it was, it was clear. But I knew, you know, he wasn't afraid, I wasn't afraid. We both understood the importance of it because of the history that we'd gotten, because of the work the Colon Cancer Coalition does to make it not a scary thing to go in and not an embarrassing thing to go in for the testing. And then you know, fast forward to my, my son is the, the one person who I can bring in this mix as well, because when he was 17, he started having some, some issues. And at first I wasn't too concerned. He, he was young. We got him into the doctor to check. They found nothing. A, a year later when he was living on his own, turned 18, he was very ill. So he went in and for his first colonoscopy and he was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. And instead of it being a scary diagnosis, I almost felt relieved because I knew now that he was tested, he'd had things checked out and because he was higher risk for colon cancer because of that condition, he would be screened on a regular basis throughout his life. When I turned 50, my sister is a year older than me. She'd had her colonoscopy the year before me and they found polyps. And she got hers actually a little bit late and I was due. So I did not hesitate when I turned 50 to get right in. And they did find precancerous polyps that they were able to take care of. And I'm, I'm actually due for, to go back here soon and I'll be scheduling that for my follow-up. But my life was saved because of that early screening, because of me not saying, ah, I'll just blow it off. Uh, you know, it's not a big deal. I understood the importance of getting, of getting that screening. And in most cases, because it was found those precancerous polyps saved my life. I'm sure had I just ignored it as the kind of person that I used to be is going, ah, I don't have to go to the doctor and you always find something else. It could be something else. It's not that. The, the most wonderful thing I think I've learned from this great organization is the importance of being an advocate. I'm going to just share kind of a fun picture here really quick. One of the first things after the races that I got involved with was they asked me if I might help with an event. And I'm not sure if that's showing right. Go to my display settings. Was the, the, we did a booty ball. We did, we did a couple of these a couple of years and it was a super fun. The one thing I learned is 
sometimes you have to be really creative, just like the, the Tour de Tush or the 5K races. How do we get people involved versus just, you know, presentations and speakers and doctors? But what can we do to show them, get people involved, find different ways to be able to share the message? So we did a couple of booty balls that were awesome. We actually got noticed online and Minnesota Monthly Magazine came to us and offered to take some photographs and we got this really nice spread two years in a row in that magazine. In 2015, my husband was diagnosed with an aortic, aortic, aortic aneurysm and aortic valve disease that would require surgery, which was really a terrifying diagnosis when you think about that. But you know, what I learned from this organization again was that importance of advocacy and finding ways to reach out. When you've got a disease that's rare but very treatable if found early, how do you get your message out there? And before Pete went in for his surgery a few years later in 2017, he looked at me and he said, you know, Amy, if I make it, when I make it to the other side of this, I want to do something to help other people. I want to do something so that other people aren't out there searching for information and feeling as lost and confused as I did and as terrified as I did after this diagnosis. So we started Rock from the Heart, and it's just an event where we started with an idea of maybe just a small concert with Pete's band because he was a drummer, so maybe we would schedule the American Legion or a small event center, but I learned from my friend Kristen that sometimes if you want to get noticed, you have to go big. So our very first event in 2019, we rented the Pantages Theater in downtown Minneapolis and had the band Night Ranger play. And while it was just a concert, you'd be amazed by just getting out there. People see your logo. People see what you've gone through. They see what you're posting on social media and they ask, what is this about? What is the importance about it? You know, my doctor told me I had such and such of this. Maybe I should get it checked. It's just an important thing to do to be aware of what's going on with our bodies. And the more vocal we are as, as survivors and advocates, we're going to be able to reach those people that may be thinking about it, that may have an issue, but they just haven't taken that next step to get checked, especially during COVID, like Dr. Albert talked about. A lot of people have been missing appointments. They're not going in for screenings. We really need to continue these awareness to make sure these regular physicals are, are taking place. Had, had Pete not gone in for his annual physical and the doctor heard a heart murmur, he might not be here with us today. The condition, it, it would have taken his life. And thankfully we went in, it was found, it was treatable and he's doing great. So I'm just gonna share again really quick to go to my next slide. And I don't know if you're seeing that now because my screen kind of went weird again with my dual screen. So I'll go here, now you should see. And one thing we learned is to start each day with a grateful heart. Um, the picture on the right is, is Pete, those first 24 hours after his open heart procedure to replace his aortic valve and his ICU nurse who was amazing. But that is our mission, we, to help people who are diagnosed to find the answers that they need so that they're less afraid. And now it's not letting me unshare my screen. Oh, here it is over here, technology. I'm usually really good at this. Um, anyway, that's my story. It's kind of a long one, but again, it just really goes back to everything I learned from just being a volunteer with the Colon Cancer Coalition and the importance sometimes of just being there, being involved and meeting those people. You, you never know who your story is gonna touch until you tell it. And that's all I have. Thanks, Erin, for having me today. Thank you so much, Amy, for being here and sharing um, sharing your story and your journey with, with Pete as well. Um, I want to thank both Amy and Gail. Both of them have done really big things with their stories, um, and I know that can also be intimidating. I'm going to invite our friend um, Doug Dahlman now to share some tangible things that you can do that don't involve large public events or other intimidating um, things that can be intimidating in large public displays. But 
rather ways that you can reach out to individuals. Doug is a very good friend of the Colon Cancer Coalition and is well known in the colorectal cancer community. At age 40, he had been experiencing increasingly worsening symptoms for a decade and doctors were unable to determine the cause. When he went to see his doctor for his 40 year old physical, that included his first prostate check and the doctor discovered a low lying tumor. He was diagnosed with stage three rectal cancer a week later. After his diagnosis, he encouraged his brothers to be screened. Two had polyps removed, including one that was precancerous. Other family members were also inspired to get screened and polyps were caught in a few of them as well. Now, 20 years after symptoms first appeared and 10 years after diagnosis, Doug is cancer-free. He enjoys the outdoors and is an avid hiker, backpacker, and even competed in a few bodybuilding competitions to prove he's still capable of pushing his body after cancer. He's a constant advocate for living life after cancer and not letting an ostomy slow you down. We are so pleased to invite Doug to share some best practices for sharing your story. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you so much for that introduction. As Aaron said, and as Gail and Amy have uh, reiterated, sharing your story is so important. Even uh, 11 years after diagnosis, um, you know, having just turned 50, uh, last year, a uh, year and a half ago now, um, bugging my high school classmates who I also knew were turning 50 to get their colonoscopies. You know, uh, uh, many of them did and the same situation with my brothers. Uh, a number of them reached out to me and said, thank you for pushing me to uh, keeping this on the radar. And, uh, you know, I, I, they had some polyps that were removed from me too. So uh, thank you, you know, you, you saved me from a lot of trouble. So that just goes to show that um, there's always room for your story and there's always opportunities to make a difference uh, even well after you were diagnosed and well after treatment. For me, it's uh, 11 plus years now. But Aaron said, I'm, I'm not here to, to tell too much about my story to get practical advice on uh, the many outlets uh, online and elsewhere where you can share your story. Um, I got to give a uh, recognize that this deck uh, is a deck put together by Sarah DeBoard, the former communications uh, director at the Colon Cancer Coalition. Uh, Sarah was my partner and a force in the community and, and uh, she, she passed away from stage four colorectal cancer last July. So she's featured prominently in this deck and these slides are hers. So social media, yeah, it's a great place to, to tell your story. You know, it's no great secret that social media is out there. It is 2020. Um, it's where everyone connects with everyone else. And the great thing about social media is, you know, even though you may not get likes or people comment on your posts on whatever platform you're using, you are reaching a lot of people with your messages and what content you're out there. Uh, your social media advocacy can, can take the form of, if you're going through treatment, just telling people what you're doing. S having people see what you're going through as a cancer survivor can motivate them like, boy, this looks like it's kind of a gruel uh, and not a whole lot of fun. You know, I'm about that age, uh, 45 and older, or I got a family history or whatever. Symptoms, this is something that I should probably take it care of, or they know somebody else. Who, who is in a similar situation. Just seeing your story and constantly telling people what you were going through on social media as you go through things can make a difference that you're never going to be aware of. There's So this deck is a, is a pretty lengthy deck. We're not gonna get through all of it. And Aaron says this will be posted, uh, the, the full slide deck. So I'm gonna jump around a bit and uh, not go through the full formal presentation. So. I want to jump into the various platforms that are out there. We, we know them all. We've heard them all. Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and, and now even TikTok. You know, the big behemoth is Facebook. You know, it's more of a your friends and family. Um, it's not the, the hottest, quickest moving platform in terms, I think, in terms of getting your message out. But some tips on Facebook for doing advocacy is make sure your posts are public. Uh, in the lower left here, you can see, uh, you know, who is my post being shared with? Here it says friends. Well, make sure that's public so everybody out there can see your posts. Um, 
if you start doing a lot of advocacy posting and you start getting a lot of followers in the CRC community, you know, if you want to, social media can overwhelm you, even on just one platform like Facebook. You can accept friend requests, that's fine. Uh, but don't feel obligated to follow every person that follows you. Um, you can, it's, you know, you need to have your own life and uh, operate social media however you want to operate it. But you know what, you know, just have, have social media, uh, put some boundaries up around it. Um, they can follow you, but you don't have to follow them and they can still see your content. So that's a, a very quick overview of Facebook. Instagram, it, it's, a, it's a visual social media platform. So let your pictures tell the story. I think Facebook is a, is a fine place to post maybe a multi-paragraph uh, post or a share. But social, you know, Instagram, it's, it's the picture and a short description. And Instagram is more about the hashtags and of course the photo. Again, you wanna make sure your profile is public so that people can see it, anyone can see it. And uh, there's an underused, or I think an underused feature of Instagram that I really like. It's these highlights. You can put, you know, if you're sharing just your general social life, uh, what happens, non-cancer stuff, you can have those, create a little album. Highlights are like albums. So you can create an album for non-cancer stuff. You can have an album for, for treatment or doctor visits. And that way people can come to your Instagram page and flip through uh, the posts that are related to just what they're interested in, your advocacy work or your cancer journey. One thing that I do think is important is to share up what you, uh, mix up what you share on various platforms. You do have the ability on Instagram to have whatever you post on Instagram be immediately shared in other platforms. But to me, that looks kind of lazy. And if you do do that, Share it on Facebook, but then go to Facebook and edit it. Mix it up. Um, the hashtags are pretty important on Instagram. Again, I think that's where hashtags are most useful. I don't think they're used or relied upon too much on Facebook. So use your hashtags on Instagram. And uh, one final post, and this really goes for all platforms, is uh, you know if you go out or wherever you, you will go out and you take 20 pictures, don't go post 10 of them on Instagram. Just post the one. You don't need to overshare. Uh, and that doesn't, doesn't just go for single posts, but don't feel the pressure to post every day about your journey. You know, make it be, your, make it be authentic. Make your posts be organic. This is something that I really want to share. I'm really having a hard time. I could use a little support, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but don't go out of your way like, oh, you know, I'm, a, I'm such a huge advocate and, I, and I've got to post today because it's been one day. If I don't post today, you know, everyone's going to wonder where I am. No, it's just poor post organically. Have your content be sincere, authentic, genuine. I think those are the most uh, interesting posts that uh, that, got, that go the farthest. I think if you if you overpost and you're forcing it, people can can kind of detect that, and you're going to lose some of your audience. So if you're trying to be an advocate and you're trying to to build an audience because you want to make a difference, you know, be be you know just curate when you, what you want to post. Uh, again, I think if you just have it be organic, use that as a gut check, uh, you'll be fine. Uh, really quick on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is the one platform I don't do a lot on, but Sarah would always say Twitter is where it's at. That's where the the the, the most uh, reach you'll probably have with your with your messages, and it's it's just where in the in the CRC community it's where providers, doctors, PAs, nurses, researchers, it's where the other orgs are participating, companies. That's where more people are. They're that we're at least where they're active. It's a quick moving conversation, so you want to be a part of it. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that's that's Twitter. You know, a couple, a few more things about Twitter. It's um, you you don't get an opportunity to go back and edit your tweets. So take the time to edit, re-edit, and look at it again one more time before you post. Um, I personally, I think if I see grammar mistakes and spelling mistakes, you know, post on any platform, I kind of discount what they're saying. You know, if, 
care about what you're posting. Uh, if you don't care, I'm not going to care. You know, so simple checks. That's pretty easy. Um, another thing beyond hashtags that are useful to get the message out are mentions. And mentions are uh, phrases, you know, uh, tags with, a, with the at symbol before it. If you, and they're reserved for people and orgs, other entities that have another profile on any of these platforms. If you mention someone or an org, they will get a notice that you've mentioned them in their post. So that's a great way to catch the attention of a company whose eye you might be trying to get. Um, and that's, you know, hey, so, so, so try that. And it never hurts, right, to, uh, to reach out to, you know, uh, do a mention for Olympus or another organization that you know sponsors events in the CRC communities. So that's, uh, so that's Twitter. I don't have a slide for TikTok, but I do see uh, people who are very active in the CRC community use that uh, quite a bit. So think of it as the video version of Twitter. Uh, again, it's fast moving. The posts, I believe, don't stay forever. But, uh, but check out Twitter as well. And who knows what platform is going to be down the road. Um, I think the rules of engagement are important here. So, you know, you're, yeah, it's social media, people overpost, and we all know people who probably post things that they probably shouldn't be posting. But if you're going to be an advocate uh, in the CRC community, or really any community, think about what you're posting. Take a moment. Is this something, if you're questioning uh, whether or not it's appropriate, it probably isn't appropriate. Treat it like a PG-13 movie, you know. Um, Sarah put down alcohol on there. You know, if you've had a few, if you've had a few, if you're doing something silly, you take a picture of it, eh, probably don't post it on social media if you're going to operate in this well, in this realm. Some things that I have learned over the years about social media, I've already talked about how honest, thoughtful, and original content can go far. I think uh, along those lines, you know, avoid overusing the hashtag flashback Friday or throwback Thursday. That's just, you know, to me, rehashing old content. And, you know, I know people in the community who, who you know, just cycle through the same old, you know, half a dozen or dozen posts throughout the year. And it's just, you know, I've kind of tuned them out. Uh, I don't follow them anymore because there's nothing new to follow there. I've seen it all. Um, and the, the fourth bullet here, time advocacy to what you're currently going through. So yeah, I look at my situation. When I was going through treatment, I had a blog post. That was my preferred platform at the time. That was 2010. And you know, I put long, long posts, but I wrote about what I was going through. I was going through treatment. After treatment, I talked about life with an ostomy, a permanent ostomy, which I, I had to adjust to. I talked about physical recovery and being able to do the things I loved, being really physically active outdoors and just pushing myself to see what my body still could go through. That's the stuff I talked about. After five years and you get to that five-year milestone, I talked less and less about my journey. It was more about life as an ostomy. And in the last uh, 18 months through all my experiences with Sarah, you know, it's it's been more as a caregiver and, and still keeping the ostomy thing going. So I think your, your voice probably is most authentic um, and listened to if you talk about the things that you're currently going through. And again, the, the last three here kind of all, I'll tie it together. You know, as I said, don't force it. Just follow your gut and how much you should post. Uh, be you, you know. I'm not going to be, you know, if I try to add like a 20 something social media influencer, it's going to fall flat. That's just not me. And um, as far as the platforms, you know, there's, there's a couple of them we've mentioned, and that's quite a few. You can consume yourself just being completely active on one platform, but use the ones that work for you. Again, you know, it just go with the flow, um, use the platforms your life, you like, be you, and just be authentic. Uh, I don't want to uh, waste too much more time on the rest of these slides, but so I'm just going to touch on, on these really quick. Um, you know, it's very important, as Gail was saying, you know, you, you got to go out there and hustle and uh, be your own PR team. And there is, there is a lot out there, uh, avenues for your story. When March rolls around, uh, the local newspapers, radio stations, they're looking for stories. And uh, you might think they'd have them all lined up. Well, no, they don't. 
So you can reach out to them and see if they're interested in having someone, uh, a CRC survivor, tell their story. You can talk to your hospital. They usually have a communications team there, an outreach team who are looking for people, uh, who's looking for, pe for people to tell their, their story during the month of March. Uh, I did that with my provider out in Portland. Uh, same with, uh, and, and they put me, they did a, a separate video uh, of just kind of a little featurette about me and my story. They posted on their own internal page, uh, but they also hooked me up with a local radio or a TV station. And I did a, a quick morning segment, a little 30 second segment. So, so that's ways to, um, you know, really be your own advocate just, just as long as, as well as in your health uh, provider world, you also need to be your own advocate in telling your story. Uh, here on media, you know, Sarah talks about all the various ways you be you should be able to tell your story effectively. Thirty second snippet for uh, for a radio or a commercial, uh, or, or, or a, a quick segment on a morning talk show. Sixty seconds in front of a, a legislature if you can get an audience with them. Uh, three minute in studio interviews, taped interviews, fifteen minutes, thirty minute interview for a phone article. All those things, you should be able to um, tell your story in each of those, I think, uh, you know, in those timelines. Uh, engagement and trolls, I think this is important to talk about. You know, there's always gonna be haters out there. And I was kind of shocked uh, when Sarah had, she had a, an amazing opportunity to have her story be told in the New York Times a few years ago. And she had a, uh, I think she was asked to respond to a lot of the comments that were made to her article. And there was a lot of haters and she was really taken aback by that. And I'm not gonna lie, it, it really hurt her. But uh, you've just had to develop a thick skin because those people are gonna be out there no matter what. So you gotta, you gotta ignore the trolls and just don't let it get to you. But it's good to know going in that that's gonna be out there. So watch out for that and just ignore those people. Um, you know, last couple of slides here. Beyond social media, there's so much you can do on the national level and the, and the local level as well. There's national orgs like Colon Cancer Coalition. Fight Colorectal Cancer has a annual event call on Congress where every state uh, has a delegation that goes and uh, Fight CRC will set up meetings with all of their uh, national uh, representatives, senators and House of Representatives and meet them all and push whatever le legislative bills are related to CRC uh, for, that, for that session of Congress. And that's a great event to meet many people in the community as well and not just meet your legislature, your uh, legislators. You can also write letters, send emails, uh, you know, interact with your representatives on social media. Another org, American Cancer Society, they have a cancer action network. They have a lot of going on. Just see what other orgs are doing. If you get tied with one org, you know, tied into one org, don't feel 100% allegiance to that org. There are so many other platforms, uh, so many other organizations that have opportunities for you to tell your story. And really by now with, uh, as long as I've been in the CRC advocacy nonprofit world, I know people from all the orgs and they, and they're always kind of participating or dabbling in, in each of them, you know, because each of them have their own um, thing that they're really good at. And each person may want to do a little bit of each one of those things, try them out and see which one you like. And then if there's something really, you know, uh, gets you motivated, then you can pour more of your advocacy efforts into that. Writing opportunities. Sarah was a writer, so of course you're going to see a writing slide in this deck. Uh, you again, just like the radio stations and the TV stations, there are more opportunities out there than you may think. And just about the, the quick snippets on this slide, you, you know, Ostomy Connection, Cure Magazine, Elephants and Tea. There are all uh, links here on how to share your story. I got uh, turned on to cure from someone. They're like, hey, Doug, with all the, the bodybuilding thing you're doing, you know, that's kind of different for someone with a permanent ostomy. I bet you they'd be interested in your story. Sure enough, you know, send the email. They said, that's great. Send us some pictures and write the uh, X words, did that, and then boom, you know, it ran. And uh, 
that got some attention, did some great advocacy work, and I was pretty proud of that. Sarah wrote for Cure periodically, got paid for it actually, for uh, well over a year. So, there, and, there, and a lot of these orgs at the Colon Club, they have their own individual blogs and they're always looking for stories. So if you like writing, if that's your avenue, you're not maybe a social media person, check out writing. There's plenty that you can do there. And that's it. I'll turn it back to you, Aaron. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate you sharing those words and it was good to see Sarah's face in all of those slides. Um, I do have, I think we had the right group of panelists because we have no questions. So everyone covered their topics really well, but um, I think maybe this is a question for Gail and Doug and Amy, if you want to flip your cameras back on. There's one question about um, the best way to share and present stories. So I'll just read the question. Um, I'm dipping my toe into the advocacy community in honor and memory of my late husband who was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer at the age of 49 in 2017. Any suggestions as to how best to share and present or tailor those memorial stories? I have some thoughts, but I'm wondering if any of our other... I'll jump in. I think, um, if, you know, Wendy there, uh, if, if you go to the slide deck that um, I presented and you can see the various avenues, uh, there's quite a few out there. You know, Faces of Blue with Colorectal Cancer, Colon Cancer Coalition, um, Colon Club blog posts and reaching out to the various um, writing platforms and uh, local newspapers, uh, TV stations during the month of March. Those are all ways to get the story out. And as far as shaping it, your presentation, I think that's going to depend on the uh, platform that you that you choose. And I would echo some of what Doug said too in while he was presenting is just to be authentic and share your husband's story, share what his hopes and dreams were and how his loss has impacted you, um, your family and your extended family. Those are the stories that need to be told. And one thing that um, I always reiterate to people that are struggling is that you never know who your story will impact. It might, you know, there might be a detail that you share that really resonates with someone that hears the story and makes a difference and, you know, can get them screened or, you know, talk to people that they see having the same, in a similar situation. And I could uh, offer just one addition there, Erin, a moment. Of course. Is you know, is the biggest critical thing, and I think a lot of people sometimes miss, is to know your audience. Doug went over some of that stuff when he talked about the various platforms. Different types of people are on the different platforms. And also knowing that a lot of times is, is take the time to write down your story, write it again, edit it down, and try to keep it in, in certain, like I have, I keep three different stories, the short version, the medium version, and the long version. Because there's a lot of areas where people's attention spans are very short. Video can be very powerful, too, if you've got an opportunity to share it that way as well. So those are just, you know, some different things. But really, really key is understand your audience and who you're presenting for and tailor your message to the audience. Yeah, very I good point. Oh, sorry. No, please, Gail, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add something. You know, I, I kind of started, you know, obviously from scratch. I didn't know what to do um, as far as getting the word out. Uh, I just started hitting... You know, everything, local, yeah, local TV stations, local uh, newspapers, uh, you know, local, local NPR stations. I mean, a lot of these uh, organizations have websites or, or emails that you can send your story to just, just, just blindly. Um, and yeah, I mean, it ended up, you know, once you, you know, once somebody bites on it, then, you know, I mean... I mean, especially the local TV station. I mean, I've been on about 10 times, actually. And, and a lot of these local cable channels are looking for, for stories like that um, to, to, to give. So, um, you know, I, I would just say not give up and keep, just keep trying, um, you know, real, you know, and then, and then, then, you know, a couple of years later, I got a call from the New York Times. So, um, you know, so, you know, I think it's just the number that you hit and, and like, like um, others have said, you know, be genuine with your story too. Yeah. And I would add, um, we as an organization will get calls from, from media outlets in, the, in markets where we have events. Uh, 
um, and some national outlets as well. So the more organizations that have your story, the more opportunities you may have to share with some media as well. When we get calls, I have a list of people in each market that I can lean on to go fill that interview slot as well. If they're looking for a young onset patient or someone that diagnosed at their colonoscopy or a previvor. And I did see a question from Jennifer about previvors and um, things like that too. And uh, we do have a couple opportunities, Jennifer, I think that would be really good to share and we'll maybe hold your question because I think Annie can help answer that as well. But um, there, we are always looking for a variety of stories, a variety of people to tell those stories, age, ethnicity, diagnosis stage, experience. So the more organizations that have your information, that have your story and who know that you are willing to share that information, um, the more opportunity for a platform you'll have as well, in addition to any social media advocacy that you do. So I think um, that's the end of the Q&A. So we are right at the end of time. I want to give Annie a chance to kind of wrap up. She has something that she would like to share from Olympus. And then I have one more slide that to share some places where you can share your story right now. So Annie, can I have you come back? Thanks, Erin. Um, I, I think all of our viewers will agree that today's stories were um, incredibly inspiring. Uh, I obviously know Gail's very well, but will always be in awe of the fact that the first time he told it in public at the first Tour de Tush, he actually saved a life. I mean, that's a testament to how powerful stories can be. So today we really want to encourage you to share your survivor story with us to feature um, in this campaign and to spread the word to others so that they'll share too. If you're willing to share your story, please visit the Colorectal Cancer Survivor Story webpage on truetolife.com. Um, we have someone who's going to put that in the chat so that, um, so that you won't forget it. Um, as Dr. Albert said, we've seen a drop of, eight, of more than 80% in colonoscopies uh, because of the effects of COVID in the healthcare industry. Um, people are going to need a push and um, they probably won't want it, um, but the reminder is that earlier screening is, is better. And um, in case they're worried about prep and the procedure, uh, now would be a good time to remind them, and I think our panelists would agree, that chemotherapy is much more worrisome than uh, PrEP and procedure. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in today, and thank, uh, thank you to the Colon Cancer Coalition for their valued partnership and the work they do every day to increase colorectal cancer awareness, which has helped to achieve milestones like 1 million colon cancer survivors. Thanks again, Erin, for everything. Thank you, Annie. And I have a, a slide up here that should um, show both the Olympus's webpage when you go to share your story and also the coalition, the Colon Cancer Coalition's storytelling opportunity as well through our Faces of Blue series. Um, we'll make sure that when we send the slide deck out and the recording that those links are available to you for sharing. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Olympus, for being such an amazing partner. And I look forward to um, seeing all of your stories and the work that gets done in colorectal cancer advocacy. Have a wonderful day and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.